Aloha and welcome. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about module 13, maintaining windows. So this is uh, part two, uh, CompTIA A plus core two, 220-1102. So the module objectives here are going to be, uh, at the end, we should be able to set up and perform scheduled preventative maintenance tasks to keep windows healthy and prepare for disaster. Should be able to use Windows tools, including disk management to manage the hard drives. And you should be able to use a uh, command line to um, uh, manage files, folders, and hard drives. <clears throat> so critical windows settings and backup procedures. Uh, so the following are the critical windows settings that you need to verify uh, when you first set up a system. You need to make sure that you've got your windows updates set uh, to uh, update. Uh, some uh, servers you may not want to do automatic updates because uh, you know when you've got a, a working system, they may have conflicts. It's best to do that in a sandbox. Uh, before you do it on a server, but uh, for uh, and often when you're doing it on, uh, you know the um, the system. If you're in an enterprise network where people use certain standardized uh, software, you would be uh, doing something like uh, setting up a sandbox, making sure everything works with it, and then uh, you know releasing that. But uh, you can go into Windows updates, and uh, if you're just doing home things like that, you can set up automatic Windows updates without much worry. Um, you should also set up antivirus, anti-malware uh, software so that you've got uh, protection on your system. Um, you should also check your network uh, security settings, uh, backup, uh, you know, check for backups of user data, the Windows volume, the system files. Uh, you should uninstall software that you're not needing anymore because those can become security liabilities over time. Uh, you should clean up your uh, hard drive and for, ver uh, for the laptops, you should verify your uh, power settings. So some useful settings and control applets uh, are the accounts, apps, devices, uh, or Bluetooth and devices in Windows 11, gaming, network and internet, and personal uh, personalization privacy, uh, which is also known as privacy and security in Windows 11, and system. Also time and language and update and security. So there's two applets in the control panel that you're probably gonna find the most hand handy and that's the sound applet and the mail applet. So here is an example of the uh, about section. And this we used to get to uh, in File Explorer, we just go and right click on the uh, computer name and we'd go down to properties and it would give us this screen right here. But it's pretty much the same information. It's gonna give you your device name. You know, it's gonna tell you about the hardware that you've got, the software you've got, what version, things like that. So this is a really interesting uh, uh, place to take a look and you'll need this uh, later when you're doing stuff. Uh, you know, you're gonna come across a need for it if you ever have cases where you need to tell a, a, you know, a tech rep or you know, a tech support person what, uh, you know, what version you're running or uh, what your uh, hardware is, things like that. So uh, power options uh, for laptops, you should uh, verify that the power options are set to conserve power and increase the amount of time before battery pack needs recharging. Uh, you can use the power options applet of control panel to cha uh, change those settings. And uh, some of the power saving states include uh, both sleep mode and hibernation. Um, one other thing that we need to be thinking about uh, when we're setting up systems is plans for disaster recovery. Uh, CompTIA does a lot about, uh, they cover this a lot in, not just in A+, but also in Network+, Plus and Security+, Plus. but uh, there's, uh, a lot of attention paid to this, uh, the resiliency of uh, things. You know, in other courses, you're going to talk about, uh, you know, hot sites, warm sites, cold sites, things like that. So, uh, in here, we're talking about uh, uh, where to keep your data and backups. You know, option A, of course, is use no backup. Uh, option B is going to be to create and maintain your own backups. Uh, C is to back up uh, your stuff to the cloud. So you're going to keep your data on your system, but you're going to back it up to the cloud. Uh, another option is to just keep all your data in the cloud so that uh, you're not actually storing it locally. You can do something like uh, with uh, Google Drive where uh, you have files that are cached locally, but after they haven't been used for a while, they only exist in the cloud. So it, it, it's a really good way of doing it because it, it's essentially called file streaming and it keeps all of your files uh, on the internet, but it keeps the ones that you're going to be working on uh, locally. And it's pretty seamless. You're not going to really notice. You may notice a little bit of a lag when you go to open up something that's not locally cached. And you'll see a little bit of a lag while it pulls it down and opens it up for you. Um, 
Option E here is uh, data is kept on a local file server and backed up to private media. That's going to be uh, one where you have to do all the work. And you've got one where data is kept on a local file server and it's backed up to the cloud. And that is a nice system as well because you push it all up to the cloud. Just be sure about your security for that. And here's uh, what I really don't like. It's a, I'm not really fond of this graphic, so I'm just going to skip over it. But this is supposedly a, a visual representation of what we just spoke about. So plans for dis uh, disaster recovery. Um, there's something uh, known as the 321 backup rule. You're going to find this uh, is talked about a lot. You want to keep three copies of your data, which the original and two backups. You're going to keep uh, two different types of media, like an external hard drive and the cloud. Uh, and you're going to keep one copy off-site. Uh, and I've heard people go as far as saying uh, in a geographically uh, diverse area, because you, if let's say fire hit or something like that, you know, if you had one stored on the other side of town and the whole town town was wiped out, you're still out of your data. So it's probably a good idea to uh, you know put it up in the cloud, put it out in a different uh, sector like AWS. You can tell where it's you know stored and things like that. So set it up to store off-site. <laughs> um, backup types, there's three different backup types and you're gonna find this in different uh, courses as well. Uh, very important, full backup is gonna back up everything that you designate on the, uh, on the computer. Uh, the incremental backup is only gonna be uh, backing up the files since the last backup. Uh, and then your differential backup is gonna back up the files that have changed or uh, been created since the last full backup. So there's, uh, you're gonna hear not, we're, it's not in this slideshow, but uh, you know, when it comes to time for, uh, you know, you'll be asked questions about which one is fastest to do, which one uh, uh, takes up the most space, things like that. So um, yeah, be, be aware of that. But a full backup is, you know, again, it's taking everything. The incremental backup is just gonna be, you have a full backup, you have an incremental backup that gets all the deltas there. And then your next uh, incremental backup is going to be the everything since the last incremental backup. So it's little tiny pieces. So you're increasing the amount of time that you can, uh, or you're, in, you're decreasing the amount of time that it takes to do a backup, but you're increasing the time that you're going to uh, take to do a full restore because you have to back up that full backup and then each and every one of those incremental backups. So that one takes... It's the, it's the quickest to uh, back up, but it's the one that takes the longest to restore. Then you've got the differential backup, which is going to be doing the last backup and then everything since then. So it's, uh, you know, you're not, you're only going to be keeping two files, essentially uh, one for the, uh, the backup and then the delta at that point in time. You're always going to be doing it, the delta from the actual uh, full backup. <clears throat> And then there's the rotating backup media. Uh, you've got backup routines, uh, uh, might use the grandfather, father, son plan for rotating and reusing uh, backup media. It's explained in table 13.1 in the text. Uh, the general idea is that the grandfather is gonna be a, a copy that you take and you store offsite. Then the father is gonna be one that you take, a full copy that you take on a more regular basis. And then you've got son, which is gonna be the, the incremental uh, steps that you'd uh, uh, restore off of father. So uh, that's a simple explanation of it. Look it up in table 13.1 for the full explanation. Then uh, testing your backup plan. Uh, it's very important to test these things because a lot of people will go and think that they've been taking backups. And then when it comes time to restore it, they find that it actually wasn't uh, doing what they needed it to do. So you should always test your backups. And here it talks about erasing a file and use the recovery procedures to verify that you can restore the file from backup. Of course, you don't want to use an important file, just make one up and make sure that it's uh, restoring it properly. Uh, also keep backups in a safe place and routinely test them. They should be kept under lock and key because of course you've got data in there and data is something that you should be very security conscious about. So uh, backup uh, user data in the system image. Uh, this is a seven part series here. Uh, Windows 10 offers file history and backup and restore to backup user data and create a system image. So system image is a backup of the entire Windows volume. And that includes the uh, Windows installation, all the applications, your user settings, your data, the whole shebang. And the image is gonna be stored in a single file with a WIM uh, file extension. It's compressed, so it tries to uh, you know, keep it as small as possible. 
So uh, Windows File History uh, is a simple backup utility that you, uh, gives you a bit of limited control of your backups. In order to use it, you need to connect a backup device. And in the Settings app, you go to Update and Security, then you click on Backup. And uh, you can also uh, access file history through uh, the control panel. So here's a, a image of what that looks like. So uh, you've got, um, you know, you've got here the uh, the different options that you've got: restore personal files, select the drive, exclude folders, advanced settings. So when you look at it, you can select the file that it's going to be going on to, and you can turn this on and off. So uh, Windows Backup and Restore is the other option. And to save a backup and set up an ongoing backup schedule, uh, you can open the control panel, go to uh, click on Backup and Restore. Then you're going to need to select the device or location that you're going to be uh, backing up to. And then you're going to, uh, in the next box, you're going to check Let Me Choose uh, to select the folder to back up, then click Next. In the next box, select the folders you want to back up, click Next to continue. Then you're going to verify that the ones that you just selected uh, are the ones you want, then you're going to click OK. And you can also uh, manage the frequency in this step as well. And then the restoring of these files and folders. Uh, for file history, um, you're going to uh, go back to file uh, history and you're going to use that uh, restore personal files that we just saw in the last in the uh, slide a couple back. Uh, to restore items in backup and uh, restore, you can open up the backup and restore window and go to restore my files. It's pretty straightforward, uh, both of those. You can also restore a file or folder from backup using the File Explorer. And this is an example of uh, uh, using the uh, network uh, location. So you can specify a, a network location for uh, uh, doing a backup or store. So here's some points to keep in mind when creating a system image and using it to recover a failed uh, Windows volume. Uh, creating a system image takes some time, and that's because you're getting everything. You're getting, like we said before, the Windows system files, the application, the user data, uh, or the user settings, everything, the data as well. So it's going to take quite a long time. So a system image uh, includes the entire drive C or uh, other drive on which the Windows installation is uh, located. And uh, you don't want to be depending on the system image as your backup, because you want that to be kind of a point in time type thing. Because uh, you know, if you're if you're depending on that, you know, as your main backup, you're going to have to do that over and over, and it's going to be really time consuming, and it's really not what you want to be doing. You want to be using something uh, more like uh, <coughs> it says here. Um, uh, well, as we mentioned earlier, you can do a snapshot, but if you take that, uh, you know, one thing you have to keep in mind here is that when you do that uh, system image, you know, let's say you take that uh, a month ago. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that uh, if you do a restore to that point, you're going to have to put in all your updates and everything else after that. So, yeah, you don't want to be depending on just this system image. You want to be you know, using other methods as well here. And we talked about, uh, you know, using full backups, uh, you know, the uh, incrementals and things like that. Uh, you can also uh, uh, create a system image anytime after Windows installed. Then you can use this image to recover from a failed hard drive. That's really important because hard drives do fail over time. Even the new SSDs and everything else, they're you know bound to fail at some point. So uh, yeah, uh, create uh, system images from time to time. Uh, <clears throat> so backup uh, Windows system files with system protection. So uh, when you turn on the system uh, protection uh, utility, it automatically backs up system files and stores them at regular intervals, which is nice. You don't have to be thinking about that and doing it manually. These snapshots of the system are called restore points. They've been around, this, this system has been around for quite a while now, several iterations of Windows. Uh, you, uh, it also, the restore points include the Windows system files that have changed since last the restore point was made. So it's uh, kind of like that uh, differential backup. So um, you can use the system restore, the rstree.exe uh, to restore the system, the condition at the time the restore point was made. Uh, user data on the hard drive will not be altered, which is good because it's only doing the system part. It's going to leave your data in place. Uh, then you can uh, uh, you can af af <coughs> pardon <coughs> you can affect uh, installed software and hardware, the user settings and the passwords, which we mentioned earlier about when you're doing a, a restore or a, a backup. 
So you've got to be careful when you're doing that because uh, it will be changing those things. It won't touch your data, but it will affect your installed software and your user settings and passwords, things like that. So uh, enabling system pr uh, protection, uh, it's turned off by default in Windows 10. Uh, if you wanna enable it, you gotta go into control panel, open the system window and settings and click about, and you click on system protection and make sure protection is turned on uh, for the drive that has Windows on it. Uh, restore points are no normally kept in a folder named uh, C system uh, volume information. So you've probably noticed that on your uh, drive when going through there, that's what's located in there, your store points. Uh, you can also uh, save these offline if you wanted to. Um, restore points are taken at least weekly and they can use up uh, to 5% of your disk space. So if uh, that disk space gets low, it's gonna stop making those restore points for you on an automatic basis. It'd be nice if it did something like uh, you know, rotated out the older ones, but it doesn't, it just stops, report, it stops uh, creating them. And uh, you can manually uh, create restore points at any time using the system protection tab as well. So for a knowledge check, let's take a look. Um, we're gonna order the following routine maintenance tasks from most to least important when securing a, a computer. So verify anti-malware settings, that's kind of important. Uh, verify Windows update settings, that seems a little bit more important. Uh, verify the recycle bin is emptied weekly, that's kinda not that important. And verify that hard drives are being optimized weekly, that's a little bit more important. So when you're looking at that, uh, the most important thing I'd say is probably B, you wanna make sure that your update settings are uh, correct because you got a lot of stuff that comes through updates. You got device settings, you got security updates, things that are really important. Um, you know, anti-malware settings are important as well, uh, but you know, basic security stuff can come through Windows Update. So I'd say it would go B and then A, and then C is the least, so we put that at the end. So I'd go with uh, B, A, D, C here. And the answer is B, yep, verify Windows update settings, uh, A, uh, D, C, that's correct. So uh, the recycle bin, obviously, you know, for conserving space, that's important, but it's, you know, the least important. Uh, and, you know, CompTIA loves asking questions of, like this, like uh, what are the uh, order of importance? Uh, what's the most this or what's the least whatever? You know, uh, this is, you know, a kind of question they would probably ask. So, um, yeah, so it talks here, Windows updates include plugging up security holes, and therefore the most important of the four tasks. Anti-malware is also important to maintaining a healthy system, obviously. Uh, performance gain by optimizing the hard drive and emptying the recycle uh, bin are valuable, but not as much as securing and protecting the system. So maintaining hard drives. <clears throat> the Windows of File Explorer options applet and control is used to control how users view files and folders in Explorer and what they can do with these files. Windows will hide the file extensions if it knows which application is associated with a file extension. Personally, that drives me nuts. So one of the first things I do when I get a system is I enable the hidden files in the system files just because I wanna know, you know what's where and you know, if anything goes wrong, you know where they are. Um, plus, you know, sometimes you can run into trouble like you know, double you know, putting a, an extension on your file name and it just drives me nuts. So I always enable that. Um, and also mentioned there, Windows will hide its own system files, but you can un undo that, like I said, using your uh, view settings in File Explorer. Um, clean the hard drive. Uh, you can use the Windows Disk Cleanup, uh, the cleanmanager.exe utility to delete temporary and unnecessary files on the drive. That's really useful uh, for you know freeing up space if you're trying to install something that just doesn't have enough space. So you go in there and you can go into the tools section and choose some different things there, but you can do the disk cleanup directly from here. Tools is going to be for uh, things to check the integrity of your drives and things like that. But this is quite uh, you know, useful here. Often you're going to find that your temporary internet files and uh, your downloads and stuff like that, those are where your uh, main file or main space is being eaten up. So optimizing hard drives, I'm glad that they have it uh, specified here because in an earlier module, they did not specify that you don't need to uh, defrag uh, SSDs, you need to trim them. But uh, anyways, uh, Windows uses the defrag uh, and optimized drives, the dfrgui.exe utility to automatically defra uh, defrag a magnetic drive, the one with the spinning platters, and to trim an SSD once a week. So magnetic hard drives, uh, to defrag those, 
Uh, what it means is to rearrange the fragments or parts of files on the drive. So each file is stored on the drive in contiguous clusters. Over time, your files get written in different sections where it's available. So what the defrag is gonna do is it's just gonna combine those spaces. It's gonna take it over here and then, oh, we've got another part of that file over here, but we've got space. Let's just combine those and put them all together. That way, when you're doing a read later, you're not jumping all over the drive to find it. it just makes it more efficient. Um, solid state drives, Windows disables uh, defragmenting for solid state drives. However, performance of an SSD can benefit from trimming. So to trim an SSD just means that you're gonna erase a block on the drive that's filled with unused data. And uh, to, uh, yeah, to do that, you need to go to the optimize uh, option on the drive's property uh, dialog box to trim it. So it's, it's not that hard to do. And then the Windows is set to automatically defrag uh, a magnetic uh, hard drive once a week. So that's a good time interval. And over here, you can see the indexing options. The indexing options uh, will speed up your searches. If you've ever gone to do a search for a, a certain file and it's taken forever, it could be that uh, your, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't indexed. One thing that can also cause performance slowdown is that time when you boot up your system and it's doing its uh, regular uh, indexing and that's going on in the background and you find that, yeah, there's a little bit of a lag here. You know, sometimes you go and you bring up task manager, you'll see that you've got, uh, you know, your indexing going on in the background. So uh, use disk management to manage hard drives. So disk management, uh, it's the primary tool you're gonna be using whenever you add drives or you're wanting to uh, maintain them. Uh, it's, uh, it's really useful. You can manage partitions, prepare new drives for first use, mount drives, uh, use dynamic uh, disks, and you can trouble, uh, troubleshoot problems with the hard drive. It'll tell you if you're having errors with it. So um, there's also resize, create, and uh, deleting partitions. So to, uh, sh to shrink a volume using disk management, you right click in the partition space and uh, select shrink volume from the shortcut menu. You enter the amount in megabytes to shrink the partition, and you wanna make sure that you leave 20% of free space in there. Then you can click on shrink. So uh, to create a new partition in the unallocated space, you're gonna right click on the space uh, that's open there and you're gonna click new simple uh, part, uh, volume and then you're gonna follow the on-screen uh, on directions then the size of the uh, volume in megabytes. You're gonna select a, a, a drive letter for the volume and you're gonna select a, a file system as well. There's a variety of file systems. You're gonna find NTFS, XFAT, FAT32. There's uh, plenty of them to choose from. So uh, and then you're gonna prepare, uh, when you're preparing a drive for first use, first thing you've gotta do is uh, initialize the disk uh, when it's initialized, uh, it's going to identify the disk as a, a basic disk, which is a single hard drive that works independently of the other drives. Uh, you're going to create a, a volume and you're going to format it with a file system. So you'll right click in that unallocated space, then you're going to select new simple volume from the uh, shortcut menu, and you're just going to follow the directions on the screen. It's pretty straightforward. Then for mounting a drive, a mounted drive is a volume that's accessible by a folder on another volume, so the folder has more available space. It's kind of, it, it's a, a nice way of kind of uh, having more space than you've got currently on hand. Um, so you're gonna follow the, uh, the following steps. Uh, the volume that will host that mounted drive must use the NTFS file system. Uh, and then using the disk management uh, software, you're gonna right click in the unallocated space. You're gonna click, you're gonna select new sys, uh, simple volume. You're gonna use the wizard to specify the amount of unallocated space that you wanna to devote to that volume. And then uh, we're gonna follow the steps in the wizard and select mount in the following MPNTFS folder. Uh, you're gonna browse for the existing folder or you're gonna click a new folder to create a new one on the, on the C drive. And this is uh, theoretically what the, uh, the I, well, uh, graphically what the idea of a mounted drive is. So you look here and you see that the, the C project folder is the mount point for the mounted drive over here. It's uh, listed as the um, mounted drive 20 gigabytes. So it's pointing over at the, the C drive there. So uh, <clears throat> when you're doing, uh, you can also set up Windows dynamic disks. Uh, you can have several dynamic disks that work together to, uh, to uh, present a single dynamic volume. So data con to configure each uh, of these hard drives is gonna be stored in the uh, disk management uh, database and that's in the last megabyte of uh, space on each of the hard drives. And then uh, why would you do this? There's three basic reasons. One is you can improve your reliability. You can extend a volume across multiple drives by doing this. You can also increase the performance and, uh, and or uh, provide fault tolerance for it. We're about to talk about that aspect of it. So um, 
you, we've got this thing called RAID. We've mentioned this before, but it's a redundant array of inexpensive disks. I take, uh, I take uh, issue with the word inexpensive because often the size you want to use is not terribly cheap from personal perspective. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, this is the technology that's used to configure two or more drives that work together as an array of drives. Uh, so you can join hard drives to improve performance. This is called striping, also known as RAID 0. And what's going to happen is work is shared between the two hard drives, but it doesn't give you any fault tolerance. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that. That's going to help you with your, uh, with your performance. But, you know, I, I really am more interested in the, the fault tolerance from a personal perspective. But, you know, there are different use cases for this that would make it uh, worthwhile. And then you've got RAID 1. RAID 1 is also known as mirroring. And that's when you're copying the contents uh, to both drives at the same time. And this gives you <coughs> improved fault tolerance. But you know, you know, well, if you have one drive failed, you know, you still have the other copy. If two go out, you're out of luck. So you've got two ways of implementing RAID. One is using disk management, uh, you know, that's uh, called software RAID. Then if you've got it at the hardware level, like uh, you know, you've got it in the on the motherboard, you can use the BIOS UEFI uh, setup on motherboard to uh, to you know set the hardware uh, RAID on there. So here we have a, uh, the disk management uh, uh, menu, and it's showing you how to take a basic disk and convert it to a dynamic disk. So it's pretty simple. You just click in the on out in the space there, and you right click in it, and then you just go down to convert to dynamic disk. So uh, you can use uh, disk management to troubleshoot hard drives as well. Um, you can uh, see information about the disk and volume on the system. You can look for the status of each disk to troubleshoot uh, the problems. Uh, if you're still having problems with the hard drive volume or a mounted drive, you can go into the event viewer as kind of like a last ditch effort. And it may have recorded events there that uh, may help you figure out what's wrong with your drive. So we can also use command line interface. And for those of us who have been around forever, and remember something called DOS disk operating system and then Windows 3.1 and everything after that, you know, we use command line interface a lot, CLIs basically. And you'll hear CLIs, you know, listed for a lot of different products. Um, so Windows has two levels of command prompt uh, in Windows and you've got your standard window, which is what you're gonna find if you uh, go and you pull up uh, the command prompt. Uh, but then there's also um, the elevated command prompt window uh, which you're going to need uh, if you're going to do anything that uh, does administrative type things like, you know, work on a, a hard drive. So you're going to want to, uh, most often you're going to want to use a, an elevated command prompt window. So um, what you do to do this is, uh, oh, a couple of things to note about it is when you're using the, um, the elevated command prompt window, it's going to have the word administrator up at the uh, top of the title bar to remind you that, hey, you're doing this with elevated privileges, so be careful. Uh, the default directory it's going to go to is going to be the, the system32 uh, directory under Windows. And in order to uh, get this elevated command prompt, what you're going to do is you're going to go, you're going to type in CMD or command in the Windows search box. Then you can right click uh, the command prompt thing that comes up and just say uh, run as an administrator. So things to remember, um, you can get help uh, by typing in help or uh, using the command that you're wanting to use and then a slash question mark. Uh, and it says use the help command to get help about any command and uh, enter help followed by the command name or, or enter the command name followed by the slash you know, question mark. Uh, Winver is neat because Winver, the command gives you the about windows box that we talked about earlier. Uh, it's gonna give you information on the windows edition, the latest updates installed in the registered owner of the computer to name a few. And then uh, <clears throat> the file naming conventions, uh, file names, and you, most of you know this, but the file naming file extension characters can be the letters A through Z, the numbers zero through nine, and the characters underscore caret uh, dollar sign, tilde, exclamation mark, pound sign, percentage sign, ampersand, hyphen, uh, what I call the squiggly brackets, the, the curly brackets, uh, opening and closing, and uh, the regular uh, opening and closing, uh, the at sign, uh, the apostrophe and the tick mark. So all those <coughs> are going to be, uh, you know, used in there. So um, so wildcard uh, wild characters in uh, command uh, lines. 
Uh, th and this is a tradition that goes back a long way. The question mark is what we call a wild card. It gets you one character. And if you need to, uh, if you don't know several characters there, if you want to have it go against several, you just use the asterisk. Just know that a question mark gives you one character and the asterisk gives you several. Uh, so example, and if you're doing regu regular expressions, you're going to come across that too. Um, so here's an example. If you're wanting to uh, uh, list all the files that start with A and uh, end in a, you know, a certain three letter extension, you do a, a dir A star, I'll get you ABC, ABCD, you know, something like that. And then uh, you know, a three letter file extension. Uh, commands that you're going to be using, many of you probably already know this, but you're going to use the directory command. You've got the slash p slash s w and a uh, uh, options on that to list files and directories. You've got cd for you know change directory. Um, so you can specify the drive. Uh, it's not necessary to specify the drive. It's an optional, but you can specify the path. Uh, or you can do things like uh, if you want to, uh, there's a couple of specials here. Um, you've got the double dot. The dot dot is going to go one level up and single dot specifies the current directory. Often we'll use it like do a dir of dot and then the backslash to do that. Um, and then one example, it says uh, type following at the C, uh, the C prompt. You can do CD uh, space colon uh, uh, backslash game backslash uh, chess and that'll move you, that'll change the directory to there. We've got MD, which is make directory. We've got del, which is delete files. We've got attrib uh, for uh, S or H, which allows you to change the system or hidden attributes that are on a file. Uh, you can also re remove a directory. And I believe there's a, a recursive way to remove a directory as well. And uh, there's uh, flags, I think, for this as well to, uh, I'm, maybe I'm mixing it up with Linux, but I think there's something that, uh, will help you get around the uh, interactive part where it's gonna ask you for each file, whether or not you wanna delete it. Um, <clears throat> we have copy, uh, it has the V and Y, uh, the slash V slash Y uh, things. And essentially you're gonna say copy from source to destination. So the copy command uh, copies a single file or a group of files uh, to copy a file from one drive to another, use the command similar to this one. And you're gonna just type in copy C name of, uh, you know, you can specify the uh, directory if you want, but uh, the path and the file name to the path and the file name. So um, then there's xcopy. Uh, xcopy is uh, kind of supplanted by robocopy. It's a little bit more robust uh, version of the, uh, the xcopy command. So uh, it has a lot of different options there as well. And then one of the most important things to know is check disk. Check disk is a yeah, that's, that's been around forever. And this is what we use to uh, you know, fix our uh, hard drive when we have problems with it. So uh, you can use check disk to uh, fix file system errors and recover uh, data from bad sectors. Uh, if you use the slash F for, uh, parameter, check disk is gonna search for and fix two types of file system errors made by the FAT or MFT. And those are the lost clusters uh, or the cross link uh, clusters. Then you can use the slash R parameter that's going to check for lost clusters, cross-link uh, clusters, and bad sectors on the drive. And then, if you want to, uh, if you want to check the hard drive for file system errors and then repair them, you can use the check disk, uh, the drive name slash f, and that'll do the fixing of it too, hopefully. Um, format: uh, you can format the drive from the, uh, uh, you know, from the command line as well. You're going to have to say format. You're going to say the volume. Uh, you can also specify the file system you're going to be using, like you know, FAT, uh, XFAT, FAT32, NTFS, whatever it is. Then disk part will give you the uh, you know access to the uh, you know the uh, partition manager. Uh, shutdown is a, another command. Uh, I've never really used it in here. I've used it on Linux, but I've never really used the. I think Linux is like a reboot, but uh, you know, on on Windows it's a shutdown. And you have to be an administrator. You have to be using the administrator account to actually use this. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, useful. I just never have had a personal use for it from the command line. You can always do that from the GUI. So our knowledge check here. You suspect the hard drive is corrupted. Which window do you open to repair the drive? To repair it, 
Well, uh, you can open command prompt window to use check disk, and that sounds right. So you remember that this is a disk, it's used by everybody, you're gonna need admin permissions. <clears throat> so if you're going that route, you're gonna uh, go in through uh, the elevated command prompt window to use check disk. So right now B looks like the best. Disk management, that's really where you're gonna be doing your, uh, not checking uh, for fixing it, you're gonna be actually checking a status in there or you can uh, create uh, you know, simple volumes and you know, format your disk and stuff like that. Explorer, uh, again, you're not gonna be doing it from Explorer. What you could do in Explorer is go and right click on the drive name, that'll bring up the properties, then you can go over to tools and in tools you can do like a, a check disk in there or something. But um, yeah, it's, that's really not the best answer. Uh, B is the best answer. D would be an indirect path for doing it. But uh, yeah, B is gonna be our right answer here. And yes, so, uh, yeah, it doesn't really talk about uh, disk management and Explorer cannot uh, repair a corrupted file system. Um, I think though in Explorer, File Explorer, you can do use that uh, repair tool. You can do the check drive thing. I think it might give you an option. Maybe I'm wrong here, but uh, yeah. So a summary, now that the lesson has ended, you should be able to set up and perform scheduled preventative maintenance tasks to keep Windows healthy and prepare for disaster. Uh, you should be able to use Windows tools, including disk management to manage the hard drives. And you should be able to use commands uh, to manage the files, folders, and the hard drives. So that concludes our module. And I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out to me and uh, let me know in email and I'll be happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in the next lesson.